Yeah. Well, wait until at least the card of Einstein. Thanks for creating the spreadsheet, by the way. No problem. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. Let's give it a couple more minutes and then we can get started. Hello. Hey, Alex. All right, looks like we got some good critical uh, mass here. So thanks for joining. Uh, excited to be here again. Uh, uh, today we have Kyle uh, from Slim.ai, and we have some other agenda items from Rogers. Uh, so we'll uh, get started with Kyle. Hi, everybody. So I'm, you know, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. You can give an intro. We can start anywhere, and then uh, we can kind of dive in in any area that's interesting and all of that. So, what do you think? Sure. Do Do you have any slides about the project or any anything that maybe overview the project, what it does? Uh, what uh, are the goals maybe for, the, for the next year? You know, anything you can discuss about you know the current status of the project sure. and and on and and also what it's about. Okay, so I'll I'll share my screen. So hopefully I can do that. Uh, and and I wanted to do a a quick demo uh, uh, for debugging. Uh, so, and while I'm trying to share my screen, I'll give a little intro uh, just to set the basic foundation for everybody. So uh, Slim Toolkit, formerly known as Docker Slim, was created to um, create Slim container images. So that was the original goal, but now it has a lot more stuff in it. Uh, now you can, uh, you have these three different categories of uh, capabilities inspect where you can analyze your images and then um, uh, minify optimize or whatever that's where you create those slim images and then uh, debug where you can actually debug those slim slim images because that's one of those gotchas so you have a, 
um, a minimal container image, but how do you debug it in production? <laughs> Um, and and uh, previously it was a little tricky, but now that we have ephemeral containers in Kubernetes, it's much easier to do. So uh, it would be great uh, to go over that. Um, and in terms of uh, the high level capabilities, if you look at the core capability and what happens uh, minifying container images, this diagram kind of outlines uh, the the main steps of what happens and uh, and what's involved um, when you create a, um, um, a, a slim image. Uh, what, uh, what it does, uh, slim has two components, the main app and then the sensor uh, component. And the sensor component uh, gets embedded um, dynamically in a temporary container that uh, slim creates. So first it uh, does static analysis of the uh, image that you point at, then it creates a temporary container uh, and it does that right now. It, it started with the Docker runtime and then uh, now there's an experimental Kubernetes runtime as well. So, so it creates a, a, um, a deployment uh, with a temporary container and it, uh, when when it does that, it also inserts the sensor in the temporary container, and the sensor runs uh, when when that temporary container runs, and then it uh, um, calls the original application, and then it observes what happens in the container, then it collects the artifacts, and then it takes uh, all this data that it collects statically and dynamically, and then it reassembles the container image only with the specific pieces that uh, you need for that image. And that's how you get that minified image. But obviously it's not the only way to create minimal container images. It's just much easier to, to do it that way. Um, and, and then uh, it also creates um, security profiles uh, and all of that, but not everybody uses them. But that's kind of the, the main capability uh, that, that it has right now um, so i wonder if anybody has any thoughts or questions and uh any, have have you had a chance to use uh um, docker slim or slim toolkit anybody has hands-on experience with it i have tried it but uh, i haven't been super successful I'm minimizing, I, I, I may not have used all the different options and spent uh, a lot of time, right? But I've actually um, worked with um, very large images, like 10 gigs or 15 gigs. Yeah. And, 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 then, yeah. and there's a lot of compli uh, complicated stuff being used in the image. For example, there's like Java libraries and things like that. So, so yeah. um, the image that I actually created wasn't, much smaller, I believe, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's there's some time. It, it may work for some cases, and may not necessarily necessarily work for all cases. Yeah, depending on the application, you need uh, you need to specify extra flags, and uh, I'd say five gigs is probably uh, you know, the the best size when it gets to ten gigs. It is possible. Uh, you know, I've seen container images like that uh, successfully uh, uh, minifying, uh, but it gets tricky um, and there are different flags. So uh, related to that, there's a whole bunch of samples uh, for different stacks. Uh, there's a couple of new samples for Python uh, that, um, you know, that have been added recently. For example, this fast API example. So we'll look at a at the Docker file there. It's pretty basic. It, it's really a copy from their docs, um, and and then if we, look, if we look at the service itself again, it was copied from from the docs, and obviously it doesn't. You know, uh, it, it's not just hello world apps, but uh, these examples show kind of the basic setup for the application. It show, uh, you know, it shows the uh, 
uh, the Docker file design, and then it also shows um, um, actually, no, not that one. It shows command line examples and all of that. In some cases, it has additional flags, but yeah, in some cases, one of the most common extra flag you end up using is include path where um, for example you have an app that has plugins it has a directory with those plugins and you point at that directory uh, with those dynamically loaded plugins that's probably the most common flag but there's a whole bunch of other flags like uh, include bin uh, include exe include shell um, etc and uh, um, in, in case of these bin and exe the main difference of that that's actually one of the common question the questions what's the difference you know how do i how do i include extra stuff it's include path and and then what's the difference between include path include bin and, and include the exe uh, include bin is like include path but it also uses additional static analysis so when you have a shared object or an executable it uh imports shared objects and with the include bin and include exe it um, discovers those dynamic includes as well and include exe also discovers the executable so you can just specify the executable name and then it'll find it and then uh, so you'll have the exact path based on that and then it'll uh, it'll be similar to include bin where it discovers the dynamic um, includes etc for the binary or the shared object um, you know uh, but i'd say it sounds like it's um it's good to do a session on more advanced applications but either way if you're getting started these um, examples is a good starting place you pick an example uh, that that looks close to the kind of application you have and then you take it from there. But you know, we'll, it makes sense to do a, 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 a um, you know an advanced session on slimming later on because it may take some time. Yeah, if we're going to try different things. So the, 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 this is one kind of major capability. The other capability is X-ray or inspect. Technically, there are several commands. There's the X-ray command, and then there is lint you know, but x-ray is probably the most popular command there. You you get um, a lot of different information out of it, um, you know, general information and security-related information. And then one of the uh, newer commands, uh, if we look at it, is uh, debug. Uh, oh, one more thing. So, so when, um, when you um, minify container images, sometimes you have different profiles uh, in terms of how you invoke that um, uh, application. It happens a lot with the command line apps and sometimes with the server apps, uh, sometimes uh, you have multi-purpose container images uh, and depending on how it's set up in Docker Compose or, or Kubernetes, how it's invoked there. Uh, different parts of the uh, image is used. And, and uh, for that, one of the new commands is merge. So you minify those different execution profiles and then you merge the images into one and then you get um, um, kind of one combined image uh, uh, based on that. So that's, that's something that came up several times. Uh, the debug command is is one of the new newer commands and um, it's um, it's pretty basic now but it supports two runtimes docker and kubernetes and with kubernetes it uses ephemeral containers uh, it has a kind of a a built-in list of uh, a few different debug images but you can point at any image um, uh, you have or you want to use and then you just point at the um, target that you want to debug and that's that's what I wanted to demo uh, something came up yesterday on Twitter when 
um, somebody was trying to debug um, a chain guard nginx image and and um, you know it, it was a little tricky trying to get to the files in the target image and and trying to run uh, executables from the target container so i wanted to do that but in general uh, if we go back to the um, build command so i mentioned that uh, there's a uh, there's a support for kubernetes as as one of the, the runtimes um, one of the goals and there's this roadmap uh, file that outlines uh, the things that will happen or that are on the to-do list uh, one of the one of the goals is to add more runtime support uh, for example direct container d support and then uh, podman and improve uh, support for kubernetes so container d support will probably be one of the next ones soon um, and then the debug command uh, it, you know based on that uh, discussion yesterday it seems like uh, the, there's a there's a need for a um, uh, more user friendly way to debug um, minimal container images and that's uh, that's what I'll add soon probably in the next release. Um, and then one of the question. new I'll oh, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. So, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about how it does the analysis? Um, I'm curious about the system calls and how it checks for sure. uh, the different areas where it can actually optimize. Sure. And that's one of the related things there is the sensor. So uh, right now it has this uh, so-called container level sensor. Uh, and, and what happens, like I mentioned previously, when um, Slim creates a temporary container, it adds that sensor into that temporary container. And then that sensor uh, runs the target application and then the sensor collects the information. There are a lot of benefits there and it's very convenient but there are downsides um, to it as well in terms of um, um, in terms of um, performance, for example, because it uses ptrace as one of the uh, sources of data. You know the uh, the um, the performance impact is significant, so you don't want to run it in production most of the time. Uh, and because of that's one of the reasons why there's going to be a, a sense a system level sensor uh, based on eBPF, and that's going to be less intrusive, meaning that the sensor won't be inserted into the container uh, itself. It'll run at the system level and and all of that, uh, and um, the the performance uh, profile will be much better and it will be easier to use um, in the production environment. Um, when it comes to dynamic analysis with the um, container level sensor, it uses several sources of information. Um, it uses uh, ptrace as uh, uh, one of the uh, tools, well, uh, sources uh, for the information to dynamically analyze uh, the uh, the execution of the um, of the application, so it acts like a debugger uh, for system calls. Um, so it just goes through this loop, uh, capturing the syscalls, and 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 the uh, the outcome of that um, is very similar to what you get from from the eBPF based. Um, um file system monitoring tools you know you take um, tracy uh, falco or whatever you get pretty much the same thing there um, but with ptrace and then uh, there, there are other sources of data uh, for example another source is uh, fa notify 
FA Notify is a subsystem on Linux that's used by antivirus software uh, to, uh, to detect what's happening in the system and then to virus scan the, um, you know, the, the files that are uh, accessed or written and all of that. Uh, and then uh, those two sources of dynamic, dynamic data uh, are augmented with static analysis um, of the binaries that are discovered. So uh, I mentioned that they include bin um, flag. So there, when you encounter, and something like that happens with all binaries that are discovered or uh, executable objects that are discovered, uh, there's a... Um, um, an executable object, a binary object, and then it's analyzed for imports and then it's done recursively. So it kind of collects a lot of different information and then it combines that information into one set of artifacts uh, that, um, that then uh, gets used to uh, create a new container um, image. So when it collects the list of artifacts. It creates a copy of those artifacts uh, from the uh, container, temporary container, and then it copies them in a, in a tar file, and then it creates a new image uh, based on those files. Um, so let's see. Maybe maybe I have it somewhere. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody looked at the um, artifact directory uh, that um, slim creates so let me quickly do that so let me change um, my screen share uh, do, do we have to, more time get or should i just skip it probably it's it's okay to skip it but you know when when you run slim build and point at the image uh there's a temporary directory for that target image where there's a bunch of artifacts uh including that tar dot uh files that tar file um a temporary um um a docker file uh, file and and then a container report file that describes what kind of metadata has been collected uh, from from the analysis and all of that so there's a lot of interesting information there uh, in terms of how that optimized image is built, there's actually, oh, uh, I guess I stopped sharing. Um, there is- We have um, a little bit more time. So I think uh, there's a couple of uh, agenda items uh, left, but I don't think that will take a long time. So. Yeah, the, the, there's actually uh, a number of different ways to build the optimized image by default. Originally, I would use Docker, but now there are, there's an ability to specify different build engines, and there's a, a built-in engine that kind of does that without Docker and all of that. So one of the goals, one of the themes is to uh, kind of support other runtimes and other tools that are not limited to Docker uh, and, and include uh, including just doing it itself um, but in terms of demos i wanted to do a, a debug demo so, so how about we do that if if we have uh if we don't have any other questions about the uh, the build command or did it make sense what i described in terms of what uh, slim does when it builds images and analyzes uh, uh, the container yeah, i think maybe we can pause a little bit and ask somebody if somebody else has a question i think quinton okay, maybe let's do that yeah, yeah, I did. That. First of all, thank you very much. A very interesting presentation and uh, seems like a very useful tool. I was just curious. Um, there, there are two, you know, at a very high level, there are two potential failure modes. The one is that it doesn't shrink the image, which uh, Ricardo mentioned may happen mm -hmm. sometimes. And the other one is that the resulting image doesn't actually work because it's missed some dependencies somewhere. Uh, do, you, do you have sure. any cases? Do, do you run into the latter where, where it's just not possible to figure out all the dependencies and therefore you accidentally leave one out and, and you have runtime problems? Or is that something that you always, you know, take the cautious approach and just add dependencies you're not sure about and then potentially end up with the, the other failure case that Ricardo mentioned where the image doesn't actually shrink? 
Sorry, that was a long question. Yeah. I hope it, no, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it makes sense. And it, it, it's, it's probably the, the, uh, uh, one of the uh, top questions that comes up. The first question is, what did you do? So now I have an image, a small image. What did you remove? Um, and um, there's a way to discover it, uh, but uh, it's a little tricky with the, with the command line tool. Uh, you can use the um, online service if you want to. But in terms mm -hmm. of uh, uh, the uh, you know success and failure is optimizing the image. Uh, for me, you know I there's um, a couple of times when it didn't quite work, mostly because of the init um, service that's used. Um, Container uh, um, system D and S six overlay or whatever it's called. Uh, they want if you use those, they want to run SPID one. And because the sensor in the instrumented container runs SPID one, they fail. So those are the only two uh, quote unquote hard failures that um, I experienced and other experienced in all other cases. Not no, no, not true. Not all other cases. The other failure mode uh, is when the image is just too big, and um, and and it's just the system runs out of resources optimizing the image, um, and it doesn't happen a lot. Um, and um, yeah, haven't tried it on images more than well, actually. Yeah, I successfully uh, optimized images 10 gigs uh, and a little more up to 15 gigs after that uh, you need more testing. Uh, and, and um, you know, mostly it's, it's just a matter of, you know, fine tuning the flags. And then, like I mentioned, the plugins and all of that. So that's uh, the, the most common thing. Aside from bugs, there's one bug that I'm working on. Uh, there's... Uh, seems like there's a regression with um uh with the with the files that that uh, get uh checked at runtime they 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 don't seem to be uh, included like they used to but aside from that it's it's a matter of tweaking the the parameters a little bit and um and it uh, and and then kind of exploring the composition of the image and uh, sometimes it's it's a little more uh, work, but uh, the success rate has been pretty big. Uh, and it is true that sometimes when you're uh, making adjustments and and including things, you end up with limited size reduction. Uh, but a lot of times it's okay because uh, 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 one of the main use cases, not the only uh, use case, but one of the popular use cases is reducing vulnerabilities. And, and, um, and, and there, a lot of times, you don't even need a lot of uh, reduction in size. Uh, you're, you, know, you, you get good results with a relatively small uh, reduction in size. But in terms of strategies, so you try to, uh, you know, the most common path is to try to optimize, try to build uh, with the default flags. If it doesn't produce a functional container image, then you uh, try, uh, uh, it's common to try to include a lot of things using include path or include bin and all of that. For example, let's, uh, let's use a Node.js um, app, uh, containerized app as, as an example. Uh, one of the common thing to do there is to say, okay, my app is in this directory. I'm just going to include that directory completely. And that's going to ensure that uh, I have the whole thing. Um, and, um, you know, you end up, uh, uh, you know, with a bigger image, but it's more functional. Um, for the most node app, uh, apps, you don't need to do it, but I'm using that as an example. So it does happen. And, and a lot of people are happy enough just to land in, in, in that spectrum. Uh, you know, if you can get that, you know, the most uh, 
extreme size reduction, they're happy somewhere in the middle or um, you know one third even and all of that. But um, yeah, and then you get results like that and then you can fine tune and get better results. So it, it is a kind of a, a loop, a, a debug, there's a debugging loop. And um, depending on how much you know about the application and how much you know about the flags, uh, you get further uh, in that loop and all of that. And that's one of the themes, uh, streamlining that loop where it's easier to get to this optimized image if uh, the happy pad doesn't work for you right away because it, it, you know it's okay it, it, you know it happens uh, enough uh, but uh, you know when when you haven't done it a, uh, a lot you know, it's just easy to say uh, well it doesn't work right away so I'm, I'm not going to do it so uh, that's one of the goals to streamline that so it's easier to um, get that optimized image if you don't get it right away I don't okay, know if so, that so answered the, the like, question, but uh, yeah, yeah, that that did answer the question. Uh, so it sounds like the sort of recommended approach would, in that case, be to um, design your application in such a way that you can actually run full integration tests or unit tests or something similar uh, in the optimized container to make sure that all your code paths actually still work and that all the dependencies yep. are perfect. Yeah. And cool. and speaking of that, there are different quote unquote probes in in in, uh, in Slim. Uh, there, there's um, there's a default set of probes, network probes that Slim runs against your temporary container image, which which is uh, and it was designed that way because I build it for myself for my microservices, and and those microservices had APIs exposed and all of that, so it, it would automatically interact with those APIs and, and probe. And, and for example, if you have a web app, it will try to crawl that endpoint. It has a built-in crawler and all of that. You can also point to a Swagger spec. Uh, so it will use that as a way to uh, discover the endpoints to call and all of that. So there, there's there's a lot more that can be done there, but uh, that that's an important capability. But there are also other types of probes uh, to uh, interact with your application. Exact probes, they're like Docker exec, where you get to specify shell commands or, or scripts to run uh, against your application. So that's another type uh, container probes where you say, let's say you have a Docker compose, and then one of the containers has a bunch of tests in them. I, it doesn't happen all the time, but a lot of times people have um, a containerized setup where they also have their tests in the container. And there you can point to that uh, container uh, image with your tests and it will be executed. And those tests will run against your application and all of that. And then uh, the other thing you can do, you can, you know, you can set up your integration into end tests and that's a co common thing uh, to do where you uh, uh, you um, run slim uh, and then uh, you run your uh, tests out of band and then when you're done running them you tell slim that um, I'm done uh, either sending a signal or something like that and, and then uh, that way you exercise the application enough. So there are different ways to uh, do it. There are different probes, but the idea there is that using probes, those different probes, you're, um, you're interacting with the application and it provides more coverage uh, in addition to the uh, default interactions that Slim generates. So that's one way to ensure better coverage. And that's, uh, that's actually something that... Uh, um, we do on the commercial side as well, where we have those uh, setups. Thanks, that answered the question very well. Thank you. And then the system probe that will be added will allow you to collect production environment telemetry. So that's a, that kind of complements the idea of the integration and system tests, where you would combine the 
the the uh, the data you know based on on those synthetic interactions and production environment interactions and then you combine that data and you have even more coverage uh, we have a couple of raise hands uh nikita <laughs> uh sure uh so thanks for this by the way so just a quick question so i'm assuming like so these living techniques remove uh like metadata from the final container image. So how does integrations with other supply chain tools like Iron and all of those work? Yeah, so, so that's an interesting question because um, there, there's a couple of things uh, there. So that, um, uh, what was that guide, uh, supply chain guide from CNCF? It mentions uh, Docker Slim there, and it talks about that as one of the gaps. The the, the uh, minified image is um, is um, is um, reconstructed in a way that that's missing metadata that a lot of tools, uh, vulnerability scanning tools, rely on. And and uh, it's interesting because it, it actually surfaces the problems with those tools because they're they're so basic and, um, and and naive in terms of their design that that uh you know uh that that's easy to break them and this is uh, hopefully will be one of the uh reasons uh to improve those tools there is an opportunity to improve those tools but obviously it's not going to happen overnight uh and uh, there, there's um, um, there are a couple of tracks there on, on the commercial side uh, with my company. We actually have scannable images. So if you slim images with the serve uh, with the with the with the SAS, the images you get are scannable. But the vulnerability scanners and all of that uh, on the open source uh, side, there, there will be something similar as well where you can say hey i want to have um the uh, metadata about what's in the image uh, but the first thing that will happen or at least plan what's planned is to produce uh the the metadata in an s bomb kind of format where it would um when you get this minified image you would also get an s bomb saying that this is the stuff that's in the image. So that way you would point at that as bomb uh, uh, and then you will get the, the same results. So you'll get you'll be able to virus scan, you'll be able to do other things that that uh, use the as bomb data. So that's that's the uh, goal for the slim toolkit um, um, application to produce that um as bomb data so so you can integrate with uh, the third party tools there and and then we'll see if we can get that you know natively scannable capability somehow uh it's a it's a bit of a headache but that's that's the goal produce as bomb data in different formats spdx uh cyclone dx and then use that as a way to integrate with those, those tools because yeah, it knows what it, it it has originally, and based on that, it can construct the um, uh, the S bomb data for the minified image. And somewhat related to that, uh, at KubeCon EU in Amsterdam, there was the stock malicious compliance uh, that that intentionally tried to remove where the you know the uh, the presenters they intentionally tried to remove the metadata. And they try to obfuscate uh, the images, and uh, one of the one of the experimental capabilities in in Slim Toolkit is actually related to that, where you add additional level of obfuscation to the minified image, so the vulnerability scanners don't detect anything at all. Uh, it, it's just a kind of a just a well, it's not a joke, but. Uh, an interesting experiment again showing the limitations of the existing tools and hopefully it will be a, uh, a reason and an opportunity to improve those tools so they don't they're not that primitive and they can do the right thing 
do we have any uh thank you other? yeah Russ, yeah has his hand raised do you have any question <laughs> yeah uh so first of all like thanks for this presentation uh so i had uh two questions one of them being um with other approaches for like minimizing images being like you know maybe multi-stage approach or something or maybe including distroless images or maybe static binaries mm -hmm. and like scratch images are there like benchmarks with how with the performance improvement with slim uh that was the first question and uh the second one was uh, maybe you can answer this one and then we can go to the second one Sure. Uh, not quite sure what you mean by benchmarks in terms of size differences and, and all of that. Yeah. So, so size differences is only one of the dimensions. And, and um, there's a couple of talks. There's one talk I did with uh, uh, DevX Conf where um, I explored, uh, explored different ways to optimize images, including uh, multi-stage build packs and all of that. Uh, and if uh, so, that's useful. And another one from Cube Day Japan, uh, also, uh, you know, there were, one of the examples was distroless and then multi stage and, and then slim and all of that. Uh, the, there's um, so the um, you can potentially get to the same uh, size, but the question is, what is the journey? Uh, the um, if you look at the static um, well not well I guess static scratch based images and go for example the most basic uh, case it's very simple but if you have a complex enough application that go app has dependencies uh, it's it's not just a single file there you you deal with certificates you deal with the other dependencies and all of that and when it comes to that you end up with the same problem. Somehow you need to know what the dependencies are. And that's the core problem. It's easy to build that optimized image by hand if you know the components that need to be there. And for some apps, simple apps, it's easy to know, it's easy to discover. For others, you don't know. Uh, but the multi-stage builds, it's, um, it's interesting, convenient. Well, in a way it's convenient, but uh, there are trade-offs in terms of complexity. Uh, if you look at a simple Docker file and a multi-stage Docker file, there is an obvious difference in complexity. And for a lot of time, uh, a lot of times you take an average developer, they're not going to be well versed in multi-stage um, uh, uh, Docker files. And and like uh, I heard a story from Brett Fisher. From, uh, at one of the um, at the last uh, KubeCon, and he talked about how uh, with one of the customers he created this you know advanced setup with 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 the best practices when it comes to Docker files and and all of that using multi stage, uh, and the customer they ended up reverting back to the simple Docker files because that's what uh, they uh, they could understand that and it was much easier so that you know yeah sure if you you're advanced enough you there are a lot of capabilities that you can leverage to create those fine-tuned docker files with multi-stage builds but it's a trade-off you need to know this stuff and an average developer doesn't that's the thing like you go the other way uh the the chain guard way uh, it, it, again, it's it's one of those uh, advanced uh, um, kind of uh, uh, user approaches. If you know the composition of your application, you can uh, define the uh, spec that describes it, but you have to know it. And in some cases, let's take uh, uh, multi-stage Docker files. So you build your uh, your application in one stage, and then you copy things to the other stage, to the production stage. But that, that's where this, you need to know the composition of your app and your dependency comes in. And let's take Node, uh, Node.js as an example. What you get, you get, uh, you know, a lot of times the, the multi-stage um, Docker files I've seen, uh, people just copy the whole application directory. And that's where you have a lot of stuff in it. So, so what you end up with, a, the most basic setup where you copy, 
everything. That's the strategy. Nine out of 10 times you copy everything because you don't know the details. Um, so, but yeah, ultimately it's a trade-off between the complexity of the setup, the knowledge, the domain knowledge of the user and the, uh, the time you have to invest. Uh, so with all of those, uh, there's a trade-off. You can get uh, a smaller image when you have more time uh, to analyze your app, uh, more expertise and all of that. The, the selling point of the Docker Slim approach or the Slim Toolkit approach is that with the happy path, and I know, uh, it, you know, when you have more advanced application, uh, it may it require extra time, but with the happy path, the problem is there you don't need to be an expert um, uh, on, on a lot of those things and you get the outcome that, that you want. You use uh, Ubuntu as the base image. You don't change things because a lot of times you have to change a lot. And sometimes it's just not possible. It's not possible to change from one base OS to another because, for example, you're invested in a certain package manager. Why? Because you, you're getting a commercial packages from a third party and they only provide RPMs. So you need to have, you need to use CentOS or Red Hat. You can't switch to Alpine because you won't be able to use the software from a third party. So sometimes you don't even control that. Uh, so there's a trade-off, but I'll, I'll uh, post a note in the Slack channel uh, to those uh, to those uh, talks, and it has interesting data in terms of the sizes from different approaches. Awesome, cool. All right, so R let's do that. Another... Sorry, go ahead. Try to have another question, or uh, oh. should we move on to the to the next items on the agenda? I wanted to oh. do a quick debug demo, so. If oh, okay. we have a question, let's get to it, and then I'll yeah. do a quick demo. It's literally a couple of minutes. Okay, sounds good. So I mean, in the interest have... of the time, yeah, we can go with the demo here. Yeah. Okay, so let me share my screen, and because I thought it would be uh, more straightforward debugging. Uh, minimal container images, but turns out it's it's actually something that doesn't happen a lot and something that people struggle with. So you have a minimal container image, you know, you created it whatever way. And in the demo, I'm going to use uh, ChainGuard's uh, Nginx image. It doesn't have a shell and all of that. So the, the classic minimal container image, you get the same thing when you have a, a Go application containerized using Scratch, same problem. Um, so I'm gonna spin up a simple kubectl get pods. It's, um, it's a simple pod with um, Working directory, cats, uh, YAML. So this is what it has. It's just a pod with um, with a chain guard nginx image, and it doesn't have a shell, uh, and it doesn't have a package manager. So we have this running, and if I try to do the usual. Um, kubectl exec, not much luck, right? That's where you can use um, kubectl debug and all of that, but I'm going to use slim debug. Uh, and I'll use the interactive mode for that. Then I'll use Kubernetes runtime. And then I'll use debug image. I'll use busybox. And then I'll use target. And that target is our namespace 
Well, actually, it'll be the default namespace pod example pod. So pod example pod, and the pod command will be more interactive. It will pull the information from the cluster, but in the next release, target, and then it's example container. All right. So if we do a PS, we'll see that Nginx is running. But if we look at the file system, you, know, you can't really get to the, uh, you know, the file system we get is the file system of the uh, debugging container image. And that's, that's where it's, uh, where, that's where some people get stuck. Um, but um, the, the trick there is to uh, use the proc file system. So if we look at the PIDs, uh, the PID from the target container is one Nginx runs there. So that means we need to go to um, proc um, slash one slash root. So if we do that proc one root, we actually get the file system of the container image, but it's not as convenient. Uh, so to make it a little more natural, uh, the, uh, th there's a trick, uh, a couple of tricks. One, you want to link the binaries from your debugger into the file system that's, um, that's, the, um, that's the target image uh, file system. And in this case, it'll be, I'll use, link so i'll add the uh the uh the binaries from the debugger image as this underscore debugger bin directory and then i'll export that path and then i'll i'll just change root to the uh target image file system Rock one root. And if we look now, we actually get the file system of the target image. And we can invoke, for example, we can dump the config nginx using nginx that uh, dash t. So now you're in the uh, um, you know in the target container image. Uh, file system namespace and process namespace, and it's much easier to uh, to interact uh, with um, with that target container, and and that's going to be uh, the default mode right now. You have to do it manually, but um, yeah, you can get to the nginx config directory and the config file, and pretty much the same thing. Yeah. So this will happen by default and then a few other things just to make it easier to use um, ephemeral containers because by default, you kind of have to do a lot yourself. That's pretty much it. Well, thank you very much. It was great. Looking forward to seeing more um, improvements and the project yeah. you know, maturing and becoming more usable i think it's being used in a lot of places already so yeah and one more thing that's coming is uh, plugins wasm based plugins because that's one of the um, one of the tricky things with the project uh it's not easy to contribute to and with the plugins it will provide a, a like a number of different extension points where you don't have to know a lot about the core and you'll be able to extend uh, much easier. So that's hopefully will enable a lot more people to contribute. Great, awesome. Rogers, we have six minutes. Uh, you wanna go ahead with the next item? Sure, I'll try. Uh... So 
following up from the Slack discussion, I created the spreadsheet, uh, which is looking if there's uh, any comments, concerns on that, like any feedback on how we should go about it. Uh, I've also added my name as tag contributor to like one of the PRs. Uh, yeah, just wanted to know thoughts. What do people think? Yeah, I think that that's great. Uh, um, so we have some folks on the call here. So I mean, uh, not everybody has time to contribute, but um, but uh, these are some of the folks that we can actually reach out to and see if they have uh, spare cycles to uh, help out with the sandbox reviews. So just for background for everybody here, uh, the TOC is actually conducting uh, or they have been conducting sandbox annual reviews within the TOC, but the new process is to uh, allow the tax uh, technical advisory groups uh, to conduct these reviews. And so the idea is to divide them within the different scopes of the different tax, tag runtime, tax storage, tag app delivery, and so forth. So tag runtime is helping out with the projects in the runtime scope. Uh, in within the tag, the idea or what we're proposing is to, you know, go through the list and and reach out to different members so they can help out with uh, with these reviews. And uh, the TOC and or in other members uh, in the community are drafting uh, annual review process. So that that's something that each one of the members who are interested in helping out can follow to conduct these annual reviews. So we were reaching out to some of you, so. Any other comments, questions about that? Awesome. I, I, Akil said that he can help out with review one project. Great. Okay, so we have uh, another three minutes. So the next item, Rajas. Is... Sean. Uh, yeah. Yep. Awesome. We Thanks. got Sean. Cool. Yeah. So I wanted to bring up uh, again, following up from Slack on some of the ideas around like the container OS, uh, the charter for container OS working group. Uh, I think. Uh, so what I'm currently doing is trying to work on a doc, but before I get started on that, I wanted to run folks through some of the ideas that came up in the Slack thread and uh, have also been discussed elsewhere. Um, so I'm wondering if the charter would be around things like, uh, you know, guidance, like cloud native practices on like container voices, things like lifecycle management, upgrade scenarios, resource management, config coordination, uh, considerations around LTS, um, things like you know, flexibility and interoperability with like container orchestration solutions, compatibility with like Kubelet API uh, versus like host debuggers, uh, host de uh, debuggers or like system D. Um, Another idea would be around security, like maybe best practices for like security con considerations. Uh, and I think like the core of this working group would revolve around like fostering an environment for like uh, collaboration between distros of different container OSs. And uh, currently, uh, yeah, the projects that I see are getting involved are like Flatcar, uh, Bottle Rocket OS. I may potentially maybe you can reach out to me. So it's things like that. Uh, so what do folks think? How should we go around about this? Uh, I will, once I start working on the talk, I will reach out to stakeholders, like, you know, for contributions, reviews and things like that, and eventually circulate it within the tag. Sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah we got it, Sean. Uh, he's, I think he's in the model rocket uh, team. Uh, uh, do you have any comments or any suggestions? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely clear on specifics either. Um, 
you know, I, I, I just have the, the, the feeling that it, it would be good because if there are a bunch of us working on container optimized distros. Uh, we do have a lot of the same issues. It's, we don't want something where we're all trying to make our distros the same because there's a reason why there's multiple different options out there. Um, so my main goal with, with wanting it is, is just have some place where we can discuss ideas and collaborate where it makes sense. You know, um, how we how we get that into a charter, or how we want to describe that in a charter, I'm I'm not really sure either. Um, Rajas, if you have something in a doc and and I know we could brainstorm on it or just start throwing ideas in there and then crossing things out or or seeing where that leads, I I'm happy to get involved in that. Um, uh, other, other than that, I, I don't really have a clear picture in my mind exactly what a charter should be for this group. Yeah, I think it's wide open, um, but that, that's a good start. I mean, uh, start a document, start throwing the ideas and uh, use a template uh, from other working groups. Um, obviously, this is going to be different, but uh, we can get started with the with the different items that the the working group uh, would address. Just a word of advice, and and uh, I realize we're out of time, but I think you know one very powerful um, value of creating these collaborative working groups between potentially competitive companies is is just creating a, a common understanding for for the consumers, the users of your products. So that there is common terminology, uh, common understanding of the problems that are, different companies are trying to solve. Um, and I had some experience setting up something like that in a storage working, uh, a storage SIG actually several years ago. Just just creating a common playing ground that that everyone has, you know, terminology that makes sense to everyone, etc. Is is in itself valuable. It doesn't necessarily say that everyone has to do the same thing. Um, or that the products that come out of the commercial space in some of these areas is, are not competitive. Uh, but I think just creating a common understanding for uh, people who consume this technology is, is super valuable. And, and that's something that can be very effectively done by getting a group of uh, potentially competitive parties together to just agree on that. Thing. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Quentin. Well, uh, we're out of time. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we have another meeting schedule, I think, in two or three weeks, the beginning of next month. Uh, I think we have a KCB project. So looking forward to seeing you again and have a great rest of your, of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.